Okay, so um, so we saw that the Gemara in Baba Basra has a machloket, whether you give pri- you you have to investigate or allowed to investigate uh, extensively um, to give people food versus clothing or clothing versus food. Um, which, as we noted, might be a machloket about which is worse, um, the physical pain of starvation, the emotional agony of humiliation of not having clothes, but it might be an epistemic point, right? Meaning, what are people more likely to be able to hide? Right? The fact that they really have food and are fake starving, or that they really have clothing and are currently wearing a barrel just to make you feel guilty, or uh, whatever the case may be. Um, if that's the case, then our sugi is very localized. It's an epi- right. It's just about you know. It's, it's, it's you know. It's just about how do we figure out who needs money and who doesn't. Um, the Gemara in Sanhedrin has a machogi rudin lachachamim about whether people would prefer to die more slowly but be clothed while being stoned, or to die more quickly and suffer the humiliation of being stoned naked. Uh, which the Gemara chalks up to whether they think physical or emotional pain is worse. Um, now, while Rabbi Yehuda in both studios seems to align with the emotional side, and therefore he thinks um, oh, sorry, with the physical side, right? And therefore he says you investigate for clothes and not for food, and people would rather be unclothed, right, and uh, and stoned. Uh, rather than delay their death, we paskin like Rabbi Yehuda in the Tzedakah case, and like the Chachamim in the capital punishment case, which indicates that at least as a third party, the sugya doesn't agree with their assessment. So we went through certain possible ways of understanding that. Again, one is to say the Gemara in Sanhedrin is talking about which is worse. The Gemara in Baba Vasa is talking about the epistemic issue, in which case they're not related. Or uh, Chavaz Yair, that there's gradations. There's low level physical and low level emotional and high level physical and high level emotional uh, and the exact way that those will play out is different or the way Ellie had it which is well there's a difference between saying that you'll suffer almost no physical pain or almost no spiritual pain um, and saying you're going to suffer it anyways right and it's all mixed together and the question is when you have to mix and match a lot of physical pain with a lot of Humiliation, which do you uh, weigh, right? Which exact calibration would people ideally uh, want? Um, and Rami said a variation on that as well, um, right? So, uh, so that's what we, we saw. Um, but let's put it one more Gemara into the mix and then look at the two other positions in the Achronim. Um, and then uh, finish this sugya. Yeah. So the Gemara in Brachot introduces another data point. Okay? So the Gemara in Brachot is a very, 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 very important Gemara. Yes. Yes. Ah, good. So, so. Why don't we just ask them? So you tell me, why don't we ask them? Yes. I love when you do that to me. I turn it back to you to, to get an opinion uh, from you, and then you just say, I don't know, I, I give up. Yes, Adam. Yes, Adam, what do you think? Okay, so one possibility is that they don't really know, right? That, right, like, People don't know yet. People have never been stoned to death before, right? You get one chance to, to make that assessment, uh, and you don't know yet, right? You don't know how painful it's going to be. You what? Oh, right. So it could be that look, nobody knows, and therefore we do our best to make a general statement, because right. So oh, you know, me, right? So I think there's two ways of saying it, right? One of the way Adam is saying it is look, it's simply. Maybe there is a right and wrong answer for each individual person, but we can't figure it out because no one's experienced it. So we make our best guess. Back to our discussion during Seder of right, how Chazal come up with their uh, 
assumptions. They don't really do longitudinal statistical studies, uh, which I don't know how much you would really get with stoning, considering, you know, we try to kill people very rarely, right? And if you're only killing people once every 70 years, and even then, it's not necessarily with stoning, so, right, any particular bed that maybe stoned someone, let's say, what, once every 150, 200 years, I don't know how much of a data set you got there um, in Konami. Uh, the other is, is going to move to our Gemara and Brachot, is that maybe this is not um, just our subjective assessment. Maybe this is a statement about the nature of dignity. Um, it doesn't necessarily sound that way, but we'll see the Gemara and Brachot seems to be that way. Um, and it's possible, it's always possible. Like the, look, I'm going to say something that I don't agree with at all. Um, Rav Hanna Wasserman says this, and so does, so did the Rav, and I really, it sort of scares me. <laughs> they claim that all umdina is in Chazal, right? Any psychological assumptions in Chazal are halachal Moshe Misinai. And therefore, if you challenge them, you are a heretic. It is. And there are halachal mice implications of this. Um, oh, so I mean, I can give the one that the Rav had, which is the one which became politically controversial, which is when he said it, for the reason he said it, right? The Rav famously said it when Emmanuel Rack, Rabbi Emmanuel Rachman um, suggested that if there was a, a husband who was like abusive and was ma'agin his wife and wasn't giving the get, that revealed the type of personality that he had, and therefore the the, the marriage should be null and void all um, meikara, right? Right retroactively because of mekah ta'ut. Um, and he claimed that even though the Gemara says in several places that Tavla Meitav Tandu Mila Meitav Armelo, that a woman would rather live with a eh husband, right? She doesn't care because she'd rather be married than not, right? Tavla Meitav Tandu. It's better to live two together, Mila Meitav Armelo, than to live alone. Um, and therefore, women in general are assumed in the Gemara to have lower standards in marriage, and the uh, and therefore are less likely to claim Mecca Ta'ur in their marriage. Ray Rachman claimed that wasn't true nowadays. Because nowadays, women don't, would rather be single than be with a bad husband because of whatever sociological changes. So uh, the Rub didn't like this application at all, and at a RFCA convention, um, famously came out against Ray Rachman. And part of his argument was that Tabla Meitav Tandu of Armelo is not a, it's a Umdina in the Gemara. And therefore, it's a metaphysical statement rather than a subjective statement, and therefore it doesn't change with the times, and therefore you can't change halacha based on it. What? It was his claim. It was a claim. It's a claim. So his claim was that all umdanas are metaphysical truths, and therefore, right, and that was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so, so the, so that was the Rob's example. Again, I don't, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, and, and, and again, Rohan Wasserman claims about all umdinas, right? That any time Chazal make any psychological assumption, it's not really them assessing psychology, it was passed down from Sinai. What's their, like, It's a claim. I don't, I don't you know. I, like I said, I'm not sure I believe it. It's a bit problem. Because they're briskers. Briskers like formalities like that. I don't know. Okay. Here. Fine. I, I, I cast you the following experiment, okay? Suggest to Rabbi Ginsburg or Rabbi Chait, either Rabbi Chait for that matter, that the answer in a sugya is mitzius. Right? Is that there's no lumdus behind an answer. The machlokis in a Gemara is a machloket over psychology or machloket over reality. See their reaction. I happen to be a bad brisker in that sense, and I believe that there's such a thing as a machloket in reality and a machloket in psychology. And I have, you know, I, I, I remember writing several blog posts about this that I am very convinced and getting to a fight with Rosenzweig about this in Sheer where Rosenzweig was very angry at me for suggesting that that's what the Rajma meant and afterwards one of the other Rebbeim in YU who happened to sit in on that chair came over and thanked me for standing up for the anti-brister position. <laughs> um, um, so, 
much of my, I, I have bad brisker credentials on this because I believe that there is such a thing as a machlok in Messiah, and I'm not 100% convinced that every umduna in the Gemara was meant to be. Um, that doesn't mean I, it doesn't mean that I agree with Ray Rachman's assessment there, right? Meaning, just because I don't think every umduna is halachal Moshe Messina, it doesn't mean I think that none of them are objective statements or that halachal can change based on the way you think they've changed and whatever. It's not, that's, those are different things. How it affects halakha is a different story of whether I think this is an objective statement or, or an assessment of Hazal reality. I tend to be, you choose very dirty words in the yeshivish world, right? I t- tend to be a little bit balabatish, about my, <laughs> my phrases, so my, my assessment sometimes of these. I know it's terrible. It really is. But, they have proofs. It's not the it's not the, the issue, but it's a bigger story. But um, so again, so it's possible here that this isn't really a psychological claim at all. It's a claim of metaphysically about reality. My guess is that it's more they're assessing the reality. Look, here I have no problem saying that Chazal are assessing the mitzvahs for the person. I tend to think Adam's probably right that they can't ask the person because the person doesn't really know because the person's never been stoned to death before, right? Not clothed, not naked, not anything, right? We're not talking about people who've been stoned to death in ten different Gilgulim and have memories of all their incarnations, right? And therefore can weigh in. Assuming that your humiliation tolerance stays the same between reincarnations, which I have no way of knowing because I know nothing about (laughs) any of these things. Now someone's going to call me and say, oh, you believe in reincarnation. Someone else is going to say, oh, you sounded cynical. You don't believe in it. I don't know. You cannot, you, you have no idea. There is no, you have no idea. This is clearly facetious, but it means nothing about my general view on reincarnation. Yes. Isn't it like irrelevant what the person wants because what matters is, is that, like, he doesn't say that, that, like, you know, like, you know, pick them whatever death they want, they just pick them off, whichever is the, the best. So, yeah, well, the question is, what does best mean? Does it mean the best for them or the objective best? What is your best? Right, well, whatever they pick doesn't necessarily mean best. So even if they... No, right, again, we could talk about it, right? There's a lot. That's why you could really, you know, you can look at different stages and say it's, it's making a sense about reality or it's a metaphysical statement or whatever. I don't know. Okay, I don't know. Um, uh, okay. The Gemara that's clearly dealing, though, on more objective level, seems to be the Gemara in Brachot. And like I said, this Gemara is super, super, super important, okay? It's A, objectively important, and B, if you decide that you want to torment yourselves and get involved in all the politically charged machlokot in the Jewish community on women's issues or really a lot of modern issues, this Gemara will be quoted as like a overarching claim that the power of human dignity that overrides Yisurim, right? It's invoked a lot in, a, in a many, many of the women's issues. It's invoked uh, probably in Orthodox literature, but definitely is one of the central claims in, uh, in the, con- the, the accepted conservative uh, tshuva on homosexuality. Um, this Gemara gets quoted a lot in the most charged issues in uh, in sort of modern halachic discourse, um, which I remember I gave a share once on Kavod Abriyad, and then suddenly, like, in, in Toronto, and suddenly, like, all the people who were involved in this year showed up at the share, because, oh my God, you're giving a share on Kavod Abriyad. I'm like, ah, deep breath, deep breath. Yes, I am giving a shear on a sugya that I know is controversial. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's also a very misunderstood sugya, which I remember reading the, the, uh, the Dorf Nevins tshuva to, uh, to the CJL. Uh, when the conservative movement had a panel of Shuva published on homosexuality, the one that was accepted was Nevins and uh, was uh, Nevins and Dorf, uh, and they, it's one of the few times I know of that they quote my late teacher Rav um, on this line of Kavod Abriot because they quoted in Shuva Rav an article in Machanayim where he said people don't invoke Kavod Abriot enough in stock, and they quote Rav as saying that. 
But then they left out his next line, which was, I understand why they do that, which is because too many people quoted to misuse it, right? I still think it's wrong, but then they went on to misuse it in exactly the way that Holmes says you can't misuse it, which drove me absolutely crazy. Um, I found it offensive. I held myself back once. I was, when I was scholar residence in LA a few years ago, um, I was staying at a, a, the house of a wonderful philosophy professor. Um, and when I came in on, uh, on Friday, he was having lunch with Elliot Dorff. Um, and he introduced me to Elliot Dorff, where I had to hold myself back. And I just said, oh, nice to meet you, Rabbi Dorff. I, I have read some of your material. But I had to hold myself back from like exploding at him misquoting my Rebbe, because like, it really offended me deeply, that misquote. But um, uh, anyways, but yes, it is a controversy. It is a Gemara that comes up a lot, so it's important to understand it. So Gemara says as follows: Tashma gadol kavod habriot shedoche et lo taase shabbat Torah. Human dignity is great, for it overrides prohibitions in the Torah. Oh my! The Gemara says, "How dare you!" Right? How dare you say that human dignity override mitzvot in the Torah? Lema ein chokma vein tvuna vein etzal and eged Hashem. Isn't there no wisdom nor um, advice, no insight against God? I mean, what does that mean? So tirgima rav bar shvach meider af kahana belav lo tasur. Shmur says it doesn't mean da'oraita. It means the da'oraita prohibition to violate rabbinic law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so, say it again. Yeah. What about Shev Al Tasa? No. Ah, no. So the, the Bavli concludes that the Kovat Abriyat only overrides rabbinic law. The Rushalmi does not conclude that way, concludes that under certain circumstances it'll override biblical law as well, right? In, but no, in, 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 in rabbinic law, in, sorry, in the Bible, it's only rabbinic law, not biblical law, even passive. Right? Kanir e, Right? Kanir It's not totally clear. Right? It's a bit complicated, actually. I, I, I should hold that back. It's a bit more complicated than that. But at this point, the Gemara only explicitly says rabbinic law. Right? The Yerushalmi seems to think biblical law as well. Now, I will point out, that Lochenstein in that article um, points out, and more extensively in Mayan Osh, uh, Reflections on Judaism and Humanism, some long top, t- title like that, um, that clearly the fact that the Gemara used this rhetoric is important, right? Meaning, it could have just said, Kavad Abriyot is strong enough that it overrides rabbinic law, but it didn't. It said, Kavad Abriyot overrides Biblical law, by which it means rabbinic law, according to the Bavli, but clear, clearly the rhetoric was said for a reason, right? Meaning it's meant to drive home the fact that this is really important even on Darius the level. It might not practically override an actual violation, but it's clearly important, and therefore it's meant to tell you something, like this should be a factor that you consider in stock, even on biblical laws, even if it won't directly override, but it should affect the way you think, Right? Meaning rhetoric is important, right? We're looking at the scene where the PhD in English cares about rhetoric, right? He cares about how things are said. So the Gemara says, Achichole, they laughed at him. Lavdlot Tasur Doraitai, that is Doraita. Summer of Kahana, Gava Rabba, Amar Meltulot Achichole. If a great person says something, don't laugh at him. Komile de Rabbanan, Asmechenu, Lavdlot Tasur, Mishun Kvodo Shara Rabbanan. And so then, right, it was all rabbinic law is uh, attached to a biblical, supported by biblical law, and for human dignity, we permitted it. Now the Gemara brings, for all of its laughing at a biblical law, right, the possibility, sorry, sorry, that it would override a biblical law, that the Gemara says, but it actually does. Not in the sense of overriding, but it's built into certain biblical laws. So the Gemara says, Tashma, v'italam to mayhem. What's that talking about? Hashavat oh, yeah, you're, you're, you're 
Oh, sorry, no, this is, uh, um, the Talam to Mayhem, wait, is it, uh, it's twice, and both of them are true. Wait, is it, sorry, the Talam to Mayhem is, wait, it's either Hashem Aveda or it's, uh, Lotasim, and uh, not Lotasim, um, seeing your friend's animal collapse, uh, it's by both, and they're both true halakhically. Um, yeah, I think this, yeah. So the Gemara says, I think it's Hashem Aveda here. So Gemara says, Palmim Shatamim Talem Mayhem, but sometimes you are allowed to hide from it. Meaning what? Hakei Tadim Haya Kohen Viveda Kvaroda is Hakein Vena Levichodo. If you're a Kohen and you have to go into a cemetery or you're just a Chacham and it's, uh, it's beneath your dignity. Or you have more work to do than your friend. Again, why shouldn't you be obligated to do it even if it's going to be beneath your dignity? So why don't we learn from it? Yes, in this biblical case, there are limitations. But it's a case of monetary law, and monetary law is different because people can forgive money. Fine. Then the Gemara says, Tashma. Yes, Adam. Sorry. I didn't understand your other question. What's shape about that? Oh, passive. A passive violation rather than active violation. So it's true that by certain passive violations, we might let you, right? Meaning not perform a mitzvah or something or to, uh, to protect dignity, but not violate. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the distinction the Gemara makes more in the case of uprooting the Torah, right? But yes, you are right, the Rushalmi, this plays a bigger role, and in our Gemara, it's not clear. It's Machlok, it's Rosh Rambam, exactly the parameters of this law, right? The, the Babli doesn't explicitly say anything about passive versus active. It's brought in the Rishon, and the Rushalmi does, if I remember, play a, a role in the Rushalmi. Toshma. If you're going to Shasti Karpin Pesach and you hear that a relative dies, you don't go back to bury them. But if it's a mate mitzvah, you do. The Gemara says, why? Amai! Lehmein chokma ven tvuna ven eitza l'neged Hashem. So the Gemara says, shiny hatam dechdei v'lachoto. No, because there's a Derda Katuv that only for your family you don't go back to bury at that point when you're involved in the carbon Pesach, but for a mate mitzvah you would. So the Gemara says, Veligmar mine, learn from it. Oh, no, you're right, it is in the Bible. I am tired. Shave the Altas, shiny. Or the Gemara says, passive is different, right? Passive is different. Meaning, it might be true that you can allow the failure of performance of a mitzvah. Right? But not the violation thereof. Right? So, you're not going to let someone, you know, you're going to let someone fail to bring the Karban Pesach because he was involved in burying the dead, but you might not let him violate an Isser. Okay? You're right, Ellie. Um, fine. Now, the problem with this Gemara for our Sugya, at least as the Or Samer found it, is that the Gemara takes it as a given that whatever it means to violate the Torah here, passive, active, there are buttons, there rights, or whatever, the issue at hand is human dignity. But if in fact that we, right, but why is there no such parallel, as far as we know, by physical pain, right? Why here does human dignity seem to get, uh, right, if in other studios we, we err on the side of physical, Right? Why here does human dignity, which seems to be what's behind humiliation, play a much stronger role, right? And we don't seem to have any parallel violation of the Torah allowed to avoid physical pain. Which is, might, might or might not be true, but this is the arithmetic problem. Yes, Rami? Sorry, I, 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 
Rami clearly means that the... No, no, no. Rami clearly means that the Gemara has a cryptic statement where the Gemara in the third paragraph of Ketubot says, Il malei nagduhu lechananya mishael v'azariya had they beaten Hananya, Mishael, and Azariah rather than threatened them with death, so they would have worshipped the Avodah Zarah in Sefer Daniel. Now, the question that the Rishonim faced, Rami, is, is that a descriptive or a prescriptive statement? Meaning, is it saying that they shouldn't have violated the Torah they, if they were under torture, but they would have because they weren't strong enough to stand up to torture, or is that prescriptive? That even the big three, while they are Yeharig Val Yavor, if you're threatened with eternal torture, uh, then you are allowed to violate the Torah, even for Avodah And there's a very surprising st- statement of the Shittat HaKuntrasin, quoted in the Shittat Mikubet, that she, no, the Shittat HaKuntrasin, some anonymous pamphlet quoted in the Shittami Kubeset that says that it's a prescriptive, not a descriptive statement. That, in fact, facing torture continuously is a fate worse than death, and therefore you can even violate the big three. That's clearly what Rami meant. That's what Rami meant. Yes. So that is the, uh, the Shittat HaKuntrasin in, uh, in Ktuba. It is a fascinating Shittat Rami. Uh, so Rami might be correct that that it, the or, the Orsamar's question may be misplaced because it could simply be that we do have parallels by physical pain, right? Meaning we might. Um, there are many many questions about this. So for example, if performing a mitzvah will lead you to intense pain, are you obligated to do it? So this is a sh- very big machloket because. There are certain indications in the Gemara that the answer to that question is yes. So, for example, the Gemara says, I think it's Rav. The Ra- Rav had a very, very high, had, had a very bad sensitivity to alcohol. And therefore, whenever Pesach came and he had the four dose of Yayin, what would happen? Um, he would have a headache. Very good. Very good, Rami. He would have a headache till Shavuot. Um, from which... Many posts can derive, aha, if you have to have the four cups of wine, which is a chiv dirabanan, even if it's going to give you a seven week long headache, right? So, what is he, the Amshinavar? I don't understand, <laughs> right? Yeah, I understand the Amshinavar keeps Shabbos till Tuesday every week, but no, right? Like, it's like, it sounds like a, the, the way they describe COVID headaches, right? You have a headache that you cannot describe forever, you know. Yes, that's right. If you don't uh, murder another rabbi, are you really uh, uh, breathing correctly? Uh, I'm just going to leave that. I'm just leave that hanging in the air there. The yeah, yeah, I understand the Gemara. I'm aware of, I've read Megillah Dabzain in my life. Thank you. Yeah. Right? Thank you. That has happened. I, yes. No, no, I understand that Rabbi Reb Zera, I get that. That that's, I don't know what he did on Purim. I know that on Pesach he had a headache for seven weeks. So yes, this is part of a very complicated discussion as to whether um, physical pain is an exemption from mitzvot. So that that's very complicated. The most expansive tshuva that says, of course it is, is from the tshuva b'samim rosh. Um, there's a slight problem with b'samim rosh. Who, what is the B'samim Rosh? It is, a, it is a tshuva published in the 19th century where the author claimed that it was written by the Rush, that he discovered a manuscript of tshuva by the Rush. So a rabbi named Shaul Berlin found a manuscript of the Rush. The problem is that in the rabbinic community it is widely thought of to be a forgery. Uh, written by Rishal Berlin um, rather than by the Rush, or at least much of it, um, you know, because of all these things that seem very modernish. Uh, and uh, so they basically accused him of being a Moskil who forged a medieval tshuva to read 
masculish ideas back into the medieval period. One of the shuvah they really didn't like is this shuvah in the Bissam Rosh, where he's like, oh, a mitzvah is going to cause pain? Oh, that's terrible. You're putter. Right? Um, right? They don't like that shuvah very much. Um, uh, and his proof is from Mitzta'er by Sukkah, because by Sukkah it is true that physical pain will exempt you from the Sukkah, but that's the Gemara. It sounds like it's an exception to the rule, uh, but the Summon Rosh thinks it's like a rule in Kala Torah Kula. Uh, to be fair, he's not the only one who expended it. There's two Shuvah and the Gonim that do it as well, including pottering you from, chi- from Tfila, if Tfila gives you a headache. This is an actual Shuvah and the Gonim. And I said that I, 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 once, I once went to visit Gush, and I knocked on Ray Carrigan's uh, classroom door just to say hello. So he's like, oh, it's Rabbi Zirin. Come in, why don't you give a mini shear right now to my guys right now to see what alumni of Gush can do. And um, they were, it was before Sukkot, so they were doing Mitzayar. So I, so I quickly gave them, I said, well, Mitzayar Al-Panav is, is a localized store in Sukkah because of, uh, of uh, Teshu came to Duru, and that's what it says in Rabbeinu Manoach, in um, you know, Chotzuk, on the Rambam. But there are, four, there are four times that it appears in some Rosh, and the Radbaz, and Gonim, and the Kavachurim, where they suggest that it's, uh, it's a pure color of the Rakula, and he chased me out of the room when I mentioned that. <laughs> that particular control. And I'm like, I'm just saying the long term video. I'm not bothering that way. But he chased me out of the room. So, um, what? <laughs> I'm not talking. I don't. I didn't talk. It. It's one of fun. It's just nice lumdis. Um, it's just nice lumdis. <laughs> not my fault. Um, yeah. Uh, whatever. It's a, it's a tube of the big shlomo. Uh, yeah, I gave share on this a while ago. Princeton. That was fun. When I, I was scholar residence in Princeton with our um, a, a while ago already. But uh, but I gave I gave share on this on this question. Um. So it is possible, what Rami was saying in very sophisticated language was, maybe the Orthodox assumption is wrong, because many post in fact, do believe that physical pain is also a pure. It's just not what this Gemara is talking about. Right, that's what you meant, Rami? Very good. So Rami is 100% correct that uh, the Orthodox assumption here is not obvious. Okay? Fine. But with that Gemara as a data point, um, let's see how the Orsamash and the Kovat Shurim approach the issue of physical, emotional pain, uh, embarrassment, uh, and the like. Okay? So, um, I gave you both the Orsamash inside and the Kovat Shurim inside. I also happen to have given you an English summary of both of them from the very wonderful website, dafyomi.co.il. If you don't know it, it's a really, really helpful website. You're, you're nodding. Which part of it have you seen before? Like yeah. So it has the DAF outlines, where in English it goes line by line in the Gemara and summarizes the stages, which is very helpful. It has halachic insights, it has agatic insights, it has charts, it has tables. It's a really, really wonderful website. Really, really well done. Dafyomi.co.il, the one that I sent you to for the summary of the, uh, of the Arsameach and the Kovach it's a very, very good website. But let's try to, uh, to see what the Kovach Yurim and the Orsamech derive about the Gemara's position on physical and emotional pain from all these Gemaras. Okay. So the Orsamech, let's look at the Orsamech. Who's the Orsamech? Thank you. He's a happy light, yes. What's his name? Oh, he is from Dvinsk. He is 19th, 20th century. His name is Rav Meir Simcha of Dvinsk, also the author of the Meshach Um But good guess that he's from Provence, because, yes, uh, there's certain keys with me, right? Where is he from? Provence, probably. Right? Not necessarily, but probably. I remember once I was in Luchensin Shir, and he asked, he asked someone, um, you know, we're reading Gemara, the Gemara makes an assumption, and Wilhelmsen said, Hayim ze Pashut. Right? Is it obvious? And the person said, Yes. And Wilhelmsen said, Let me give you a hint. If I'm asking you if it's obvious, the answer is no. <laughs> um, so the, uh, 
the Gemara, the Sior Sameach says, Ulama, I met near Edenachanami. The Bizona Adifa Mitzara. Rach bit mit Mone. The Yeshlov in a road to lid Parnes, Pligay, Tanoi, the Perak Matiari Yisha. Yeshlov, Rabbi Shon, Lid Lashem, Matanava, Hosim, and Lacham Mita. Um, you know what? So he says, I think that the conclusion from all the studio together is that humiliation is worse than physical pain. He says, however, look at the Gemara in, in, in Ksubo, right, which I didn't give you. Gemara says, If he has money but doesn't want to support himself, so what do you do? The Gemara has a machloket. If someone wants to be supported by staka, not use his money. So one possibility in the Gemara is we give him staka and then we collect it from him later. He says like this, look. When it comes to food, we'll do that. When it comes to clothes, we won't do that. Why not? So doesn't that indicate that starvation is worse than not having clothes? He says, no, 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 no. If someone doesn't want to spend money on clothes, that's not humiliating. Why is it not humiliating? Because Correct. Because emotional, because humiliation is subjective. Humiliation is subjective. If you... Right? A normal person, if he's out in public, unclothed, will be embarrassed. If someone goes to a nudist colony because he wants to, he's weird, but also it's not embarrassing. Right? Right? We assume. Right? We assume that most people, if they're going to a nudist colony, it's because they don't feel ashamed of nudity. Right? Not because they do feel ashamed of nudity, but would pay that price to see everybody else unclothed. Right? We assume that's not most people. I don't, I don't know. I have never been there. Right? Um, but, uh, but, you know, you assume. So he says, The bizon who hergesh kanimi benefesh, the chiyakar et slo mamonomi vizinov ain't zed bizayon et slo. Lakach amrin and den bokin le So now he comes to our and he says, Listen, daf im ramai hu viyesh lo, vikom itza er nafsho gam gain sara et le lo cheng sut. Hello in Yeshlo, who Ramai, and Lobizayon Klal, they know near Gash Klal, may I dare a big adem, the chain, Timmy Huyava, Balazun, Hazarisho, Hachayuv, Ashina, Rote, Lasso, Lazun, Asma, Hazabitar, I'm Kenavik of Homer, I'm mixed to Avalol, and Bizjona, Dada, my Alma, Gdola, Mitar, the Albe Alma. Lochain, Matan, and the Kavoda, Rio, the Hellet Vartora, the Shev Alta, the Hain Eloy, Ukilim, etc. He says as follows, he says, here's the difference. Humiliation, shame, is worse than physical pain. And that's why God don't cover that brio to doche lo ta'ase shabbat Torah is only, he assumes, not like Rami, only for the lack of human dignity, for shame, will we waive the Torah, but not for physical pain, because humiliation which is an undermining of human dignity, is worse than physical pain. Aye, so then why in our sugya does it very clearly say that food, not having food is worse than not having clothes? So what does he say? Because remember we said in our sugya, is our sugya a fundamental claim about which is worse physical or, or emotional pain, or is it? An epistemic one, right? Meaning, is it how would we know? What does Rabbi Chaim say? It's epistemic, right? What is it's epistemic. Why? But he has a very different way of saying that. He has a very sharp way of saying, it, and that is, if somebody chooses to fake that he's poor by going outside naked, that isn't shame, because at the end of the day, if he chose to do it. He chose not to wear clothes, right, in order to fake it. He won't feel the shame because it's not shameful. He made the choice. The shame comes from that, I don't know, from the outside, from the fact that you are now objectified by the outside. You have been, right, you have lost dignity. You've lost the choice to maintain dignity. 
as opposed to food where whether you choose to starve yourself or you're starving because you don't have a choice, you will feel the pain. So the Gemara says, if somebody starves himself at the end of the day, if no one is starving, he's in real pain. Right? Whether he's faking it or not, he's in real pain. And therefore, it's less likely someone will fake it. Humiliation, if someone chooses to go without clothes, he's choosing it. And therefore, it's not object, right? Because he chose it, he might not feel it. That doesn't tell us anything about the Gemara in Sanhedrin where you're being stripped by the court, by the court and thrown off a wall, right? To your death. There, that's humiliation. That's on the outside. You're losing your sense of self. You're losing your choice in the matter. Then it really might be worse. And that's why he says that the Gemara says that human dignity will override mitzvah, but it doesn't have a parallel category by pain. And then, lest you be Rami, and you say, I ah, doesn't physical pain get you out of mitzvah. What does he say? Um, this is a proof against those people who say that physical pain gets you out of mitzvah. <laughs> Boom. Right? Now, again, are there post game who serious post game who said physical pain does get you out of mitzvah? Yes. But he doesn't like it. And therefore, the way that he negates the entire tradition that Rami is channeling is by saying, no, you mean, right, dignity is really more important than physical pain. It's just that because of the way that dignity works, is if you choose to act in an undignified way, it's no longer embarrassing. As opposed to physical pain, where even if you choose to endure it, it is painful. Okay? That is the Orsameach treatment of our sugya. And that's why he says, the, by staka, we're... It's a question of, would you have put yourself in this situation? The answer is, you're less likely to put yourself in a situation of not having food because you'll feel the pain objectively, rather than an uh, undignified situation where if you choose to be undignified, it ceases to be embarrassing, or it's less embarrassing. But when it, the Sugyan Sanhedrin, where it's about other people humiliating you, then humiliation is worse. And that's why he thinks that humiliation is docha mitzvot, dignity is docha mitzvot, but pain is not. Which again, is subject to Machogit, but that is the Ursameach's treatment of this figure. Yes, Yaakov. So, right, so this is the problem. This is why so many people don't believe this. Right? Is the Torah sometimes tells you to do things which are painful, like fast. Right? Yes. And that's why people don't really love this carte blanche, oh, you're in pain, you're putter from mitzvah. Yes, thank you. That, that's exactly it. The, but the post game who hold like Rami say there's pain and then there's pain, right? Um, right, so for example, this comes up with people who have or not, don't have a dangerous allergy to wheat, right? But have a sensitivity to gluten. Are they chayev to have matzah? Because it'll give them a stomach ache, but that's it. It'll give them a stomach ache and it'll go away. Are they chayev? Right? So this is one of the halachic questions in that sugya. Right? Rav Asher Weiss in his tshuva about what do people who, are, who have gluten sensitivities do on Pesach, this is one of the issues that he takes up extensively, which is the question of how much pain what must one endure. Um, yeah, so that's, that's like the type of case. But yeah, we're people who get really sick from fasting. How sick do you have to get to be potter, right? That's exactly the point. It's clearly you're uncomfortable. So clearly the Torah does, allow, does ask you to do things that will make you uncomfortable physically. Right? The question is, will they ask you to do things that are going to make you ill? And what is, right, what's the line between ill and just uncomfortable and in pain? Right? That, that, right? These are very, maybe, maybe at some point we'll have a share on this. It's a very important topic in general. Right? Maybe closer to Pesach we'll do it. I don't know. I don't know. I'll think about it. I, it's, uh, it's important. I, I, you know, I've taught this before. Um, it's very complex. It's very, very, very complex. Okay. That is the Or Sameach. And the Or Sameach, again, has this, what, what, what his Kiddush into this calculus is the relevance of um, choice in questions of dignity. Right? If you choose to incur an undignified situation, it's not as undignified. Because part of it 
is, and what he's essentially saying, right, is part of humiliation is the loss of autonomy, right? If it comes from you, already that choice makes it that you chose it, right? It makes it less, uh, it makes it sting less. Um, okay. Look, I mean, right, I mean, very simply, right, it's, you know, it's maybe not comfortable, certain types of uh, examinations you'll have when you go to the doctor and you don't love them, right? But it would be more embarrassing if they pulled you aside for that level of uh, invasive search at the airport, right, than when you choose to go to the doctor, right? It just is, right? Even if they're going to do it in a private room and whatever, right? The fact that, one, like you go to a doctor, you choose to do that to, right, accept a certain amount of, right, loss of privacy for your own health, Right, the lack of dignity is not the same as when the uh, TSA agent, right, subjects you to a strip search. Right, just the way it is. I think I've never had that happen to me. It's happened to friends of mine, but you know, by in the airport or in general. That's what I'm saying, right? Like, you know, yeah, that thing, yeah. Thank you, Rami. Um, yeah, we, 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 we know that the, the, the current situation in airports is a bit absurd. Yes. Um, what? What? Okay. Um, so, Rebel Hunter Wasserman also takes his, um, his, his uh, stab at this, but he says, Right, he has a totally different way of t treating this figure. His question is a little bit backwards. This is how we get to it. Rulchanan says, wait a second. We, there is a shita in the Gemara that physical pain is worse than humiliation. If that's the case, why does nobody in the Gemara in Brachot explicitly say that physical pain will be docha mitzvot because if you think that humiliation is not as bad as physical pain, then, and you hold that kavod abriot, which is a lack of di dignity, right, humiliation is docha mitzvot, then shouldn't you also explicitly say in the Gemara that physical pain is docha mitzvot? So what does he say? Right, and he argues that it's not true, because he says the only mitzvah where physical pain gets you off is sukkah. Right? So, what does he say? He says there's a difference between, and this was what I had a machloga between Yonatan and Ezra, is there's a difference between humiliation, like, which is a subjective feeling, and a loss of human dignity, which is objective. And he says, the Gemara in Brachot is not talking about your personal feeling of, human dig of, embar of embarrassment. How does he know? Because it's talking about a dead person, right? It's burying a mate mitzvah. The mate, the mate mitzvah doesn't feel anything. It's just that it's objectively an undignified state for him not to be buried. So what he claims is that the lack of dignity, right? Objective lack of dignity is worse than pain. And that's what's going on in Bracha, right? Gadol Kovod Abriot isn't about your personal feeling of embarrassment. It's about a loss of dignity, right? Which is objective. But Staka is completely a subjective claim because, right, Staka, the whole point of Staka is, what do you need? Right, what do you need? When it's about what you need, so physical pain might be worse than humiliation. Right? Because that's not an objective loss of dignity. That's you feeling embarrassed versus you feeling hungry. So Rilchanan says that physical pain might be worse than emotional pain, but objective loss of dignity is worse than temporal pain. Right? So for him, the hierarchy is loss of dignity, which is objective, physical pain, and then the subjective feeling of embarrassment. 
Um, and he will argue that in the, why is it then that in the staka suga, it sounds like physical pain is worse than emotional pain. But in the case of being stoned, the humiliation takes precedence over the Right, because the the right, because there the the right the law. It might not be that the Gemara is making a. It might be the Gemara is not making a claim about do you feel more embarrassed, but rather is this an objective loss of human dignity to have this capital, right? This this person who's chayat misa not only be killed but be killed stripped naked, right? And therefore, you always have to be careful. When is the Gemara talking about subjective feelings, and when is it making a claim about the loss of objective dignity? Okay. So what we've seen to basically balance all these figures is um, again the axes upon which we've seen them are cases of what's worse versus epistemic questions, which in the end of the day is your sameah. Questions of internal versus external causations of humiliation, where physical pain might happen whether or not it's self-inflicted, whereas humiliation might depend on external input. Violation of objective dignity, which might be worse than subjective humiliation. We've seen in um, the Chavaz Yoyer, simply the, the possibility that there might be gradations of physical and emotional pain. A variation of that is Eli and Rami's claim that there's a difference between isolated physical pain and isolated emotional pain and emotional and physical pain that are going to be wrapped up together anyways in the question of recalibration or as Ezra's formulation, which was long term versus short term. Right. But this is basically the directions that are taken to balance the uh, the implications of the Gemara in Baba Basra about physical pain versus humiliation, the Gemara in Sanhedrin, and the Gemara in Brachot by Kavod Habriyot. Okay?